Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig Dale. I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal. And this week I am joined by a very special guest, Mark Hooper from Bank Cambria, a guest coming in from Wales to talk about community banking. Mark, hello. Welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thanks, Craig. Thanks for inviting me. Yes, yeah, great. Um, it's great to be here and to talk about some of the stuff we've been up to recently. And more broadly as well, I think it's one of the you know, it's one of the things, this community banking thing, one of the few things where we can say we're, we're ahead of Scotland on this, which is um, always a bit of a feather in the cap. Yes. So, um, yeah, this this conversation that we 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 kind of met each other over over this campaign. Commonweal has been campaigning for this almost since the start of Commonweal. Um, although we we produced a, a paper on it a couple of years ago. Um, calling for a bank that looks very, very similar to, to your organisation, Bank Cambria. Um, I believe they, they, they share a kind of common ancestor in the thinking that went behind it. But as you say, uh, while we are still in the, the theoretical phase and the, the, the political campaigning phase uh, of, of this idea, Wales is just getting on and doing it. So um, we, we're going to have to we're going to have to catch up and reclaim that that. That marker from you. <laughs> um, yeah, you, may, so, you may hear my dogs barking in the background, so excuse that for a second. Oh, we're all in the Zoom revolution. We've had dogs barking, traffic, power tools. Uh, the, this is the, the, the joy of all working from home these days. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, let's just talk about the, the, the problem. What is the problem with uh, conventional retail banking in Wales specifically? And I'll talk a wee bit about Scotland as well, although I believe the problem is very, very similar. Yeah, I, I think it is. And I think you can encapsulate it in just, in just one sentence. I think that they just don't care anymore. You know, there was a point when I think the big banks did care about what happens, about their um, customers' wants and needs and um, the ability to, and the willingness to be able to support them um, to do things. And I think they've all got very um, complacent in recognising that actually they don't need to, if they're all doing the same thing, like, for example, removing themselves from our communities particularly um rural communities but more generally they're removing themselves from all and if they're all doing it well no one's gonna mind so if you know my, i'm lloyd's customer if lloyd's disappear then i will you know i can't go to natwest because they went last year and i won't go to hsbc because they're going next week so i think there's this this suggestion that they really don't care and and i think that's you know, born out of their model that they're operating. So their model is an extractive, you know, it it, it, it works by making money out of our money um, and not really pay for the services that, that come with it. So it creates a, an opportunity. You know, Wales has lost almost 50% of its bank branches over the last five years. And some of the places in Wales, Prestatin has just become the first place in the UK to lose six major um, brands from its high street. And you know, communities see that. It isn't something that's an invisible problem. This is, you know, there's now a boarded up premises where there used to be HSBC. There's now a boarded up premises where there used to be a Lloyd's. There's now a, a hole in the wall where there used to be a hole in the wall ATM. Yeah. You know, this is, this is very visible. People see it. And then on the other side, they think to themselves, these guys still make a lot of money. Um, you know, why can't they pay for this thing which is important to us. So um, that's Chris Clint. And I, just to finish, if I, if I may, I think the other thing which is peculiar to Wales as well, is that there, it is much more difficult now to be able to bank through the medium of Welsh, which is a critical thing for a, mm. a lot of people who, who want to choose that as an option. And it's very, very difficult because the community banking element has been taken out of their provision. So huge gap. Yeah, and, and um, in Scotland we've seen this, especially as you say in rural areas and in the island communities in Scotland, we've had stories uh, of of people having to fight even, not just to keep the last bank in their village, but the last ATM sometimes, or at the very least the last free ATM. Uh, we have had stories of, of people saying, look, if this service disappears, then we need to catch a ferry to get to the next bank or the next ATM. Um, but you're right, it's not just a rural issue. We have also seen this disappear from, from the cities, um, especially, probably not coincidentally, in deprived areas of cities are, are seem to be losing their, fin their basic financial services at a faster rate than others. Um, although 
probably anyone around Britain can go to a major city and they can find a, a pub or a clothes shop that is in the old bank house. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so so these these buildings remain and, uh, and sometimes, especially for the older ones, extremely iconic buildings, but they're no longer providing the service that they were built to provide. Um, but why why is this important? Why, what what happens to a local economy when it loses access to that physical physical bank? Well, well, I think it. You know, this is this isn't in isolation, and I think sometimes you know I did I, I said the other day about banks are partly responsible for the demise in the high street, and that's true, but they're not wholly responsible for it. You know, retail is going through a, a massive change, but when you lose, you know, take any typical high street that may have had all four of the major bank brands on on a corner you talk about iconic buildings they chose the corners for a reason so that they could be seen um you know some of these premises are actually wrong for the business they were doing so they were on three floors massive footprint and actually they need something smaller but notwithstanding that you you lose that from an area and and it stops the reason why people go into that town and you mentioned about people catching a ferry from some of the islands fortunately we have less of that in Wales, but we do, you know, one of the key refrains that I hear from people who are losing banks is they now have to drive 45 minutes from A to B. And when they go to the bank to, you know, often the business that they need to transact there is very limited. They'll also do the shopping in the place that they've now gone to. So it it takes not just the business of the bank out of that town, it takes the unsit, you know, the the extra bit that you were going to go and do the, you know, popping in and getting a loaf of bread those sorts of things all, all change as well. But, but you know, the, the other thing, it's, it's part of this hollowing out as well, isn't it? It's about these communities that have been left. They, somebody somewhere else has decided that those communities don't, don't warrant the services that they used to have. So it's just become this, you know, they don't care about us and, and they being something they feel they can't influence. There's been a a lot of campaigns in Wales, and I'm sure the same is in Scotland, where the community has said no. You know, we've started a petition and we've got, mm-hmm. you know, there, there was one in Buckley. Buckley's got in the north east of Wales, there's 17,000 people live there. And they did a petition, they got 107,000 people who signed a petition. So that shows that people cared about this community losing its last bank branch. And it got, the petition got discussed at, uh, in the Houses of Parliament but the bank didn't change their mind. So despite these efforts, despite these communities saying, please don't go, the bank's just, you know, the two fingers went up and, and they and they left. Yeah, and even in my own village, we've had uh, not, not necessarily to do with the, the banking side of things, um, although we did used to have uh, a bank, a physical retail bank in our village. Now we don't. We've only got a couple of ATMs and especially if you rely on public transport is getting increasingly difficult to go to the, the bank um, but we have had similar issues with other planning decisions um, where the, the the voice of the community has been ignored or actively overridden um, so I, I definitely appreciate that side of the fight. And I think um, the agency that, 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 that gets lost there is something that we're picking up on as a positive so you can turn that around as a positive so if they feel they have no um, ability to be able to influence these big things then why can't they do it when it becomes a community driven opportunity and, and some of this you know this the, this the reason we're on zoom now and not doing this in a studio or doing this in real life because of covid and things it it has actually allowed us time to question those relationships that we thought were sacrosanct and always yeah. were part of what we did and you know i wonder whether this has given us a collective opportunity to say these these big entities that do no good to me and don't benefit my community, can I now choose something different and something um, better and something where you know, I, I have an influence? So the concept of a mutual bank, which is which is central to what we're doing and, and central to the, the paper that you've been working, you know, that you've put forward as well, is that this is you have a you have a say. You may not be the people who decide the margins and you may not be people the product design and all that sort of thing, but you have a say and you feel like the bank is part of what you, you're you part of. Hmm. So one of the questions I, I always get, I'm sure you get as well, um, is why do we need these, these physical bank branches anyway? Aren't we all going cashless? Um, lots of us are. You know, I, 
on a per, you know, people often say on a personal level, you know, I don't go to a bank anymore. And I think that's something that you hear quite a lot. But there's a there's a huge number of people who do. And the financial lives survey that the FCA um, just put out showed that about 30 percent of people want to go into a, a bank branch. Now, there's a number of reasons why they do it. And they're not just you know, elderly people who who used to do it because they want to have a chat. It's not just that, although there is some of that. You know, these are people who, if the first time you get a mortgage, you want to speak to somebody. Yeah. You know, you actually want to have your, the advice to be something from someone you can trust. So there are those relationships. So that 30% is being ignored. And, and the thing that I think concerns and should concern politicians of all parties is that this 30% has shows other vulnerabilities. So, you know, they tend to be um, excluded from the digital revolution. You know, their, their access to digital tools is less than other people. So there's a bunch of compounding factors that when you take the banking provision out of that community, you're actually affecting the most vulnerable, the hardest, and those are the ones that will suffer. And I think that, you know, within Wales, this is something that was probably the prime driver be behind um, Mark Drake for the first minister saying, this is something I want to go and do because this is something where just access actually improves, um, reduces vulnerability, which is one of the, the key things. But I also think that, um, you know, the demise of cash is, is, is overrated. You know, cash is still an important part of, of what we do. And you know, I think we've got a question, who are the people who want us to stop using cash? It's the yeah. people who find it, you know, the big banks have a big opportunity to make more money the less we use cash and the more we use digital apps and, you know, do everything online. So there's a huge um, pressure on them to go and to go and do that. But again, you look at some places and, you know, we, we did some analysis between towns that are actually quite close to each other. And one, which is um, a lower income place, had a much higher propensity to use cash than that place, which is a few year, yards down the road, you know, a few miles down the road, that is um, a wealthier um, place where digital was more accepted. So I think we've got a, there's a vulnerability um, issue there. And the final thing I think is that, you know, and I, this goes back to the point of advice that financial products can be complex. And I think you can't just have the computer says no forever. They don't make necessarily better decisions. And sometimes there is that need for, 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 for all of us. This includes people who want to make money out of it. So in our case, you know, Bank Canberra, we, we're a, we want to make a commercial success of this. You know, we make, will make better decisions if we are able to um, see people face to face and understand them better than just how they fill out a form on a computer. Yeah, this is the, the, the big debate in, in banking, that, that sliding scale between relationship banking where you, you, you have you know, staff embedded in the community who know the community, who know the people coming in. You know, often, often it will be, uh, could even, even get to the point of um, you will see the same client or customer through the whole process yeah. of applying for a mortgage. I, I, applied for a mortgage a couple of years ago uh, we got it um, and and that being able to talk to someone was a very reassuring part of what is quite a scary process um, yeah. but on the other side you have the, that trans transactional banking where um, here's your mobile phone app press button get loan and, and I think we've got a you know part of and we've been we, we've, we've stuck to this from the very start. We, we, what, we've, what we will deliver will have digital at the very heart of it. So what we can't do is something that is just an analog version of something yeah. we used to like in the 1950s. I think that's, that would be inappropriate. So we, we recognize that most people will use us digitally. You know, so our provision needs to be digitally exceptional. Now, one of the great things that the fintech sector has done is made access to those digital tools much cheaper for organizations like ours. You don't need to be a huge multi-billion pound entity to be able to afford to be able to deliver the same digital app as the big banks do, or even the neo banks. You know, the, these new guys who are out there with these flashy apps, they, they're, re they're relatively easy and cheap to replicate and be able to do those things. So, you know, we, what we, when we launch, the delivery will be, will be similar um, to those and then I think the challenge then is to maintain um, 
maintain that. But the critical thing, and this is something that I learned quite early on in this um, in this journey for me, is that this is a you know banking's boring. It's you, it's pretty ubiquitous. It just but it needs to do what it needs to do. We yeah. can't launch and have a TSP failure, you know, three months down the line, or that's the end of it. So it needs to be um, solid, and that's where having the regulation that banking has, I think, is a real bonus. Now, I prefer that they were regulated by Welsh-based um, regulators linked to the you know, future central bank in Wales. But that's an, <laughs> another, day, another question, another day. But the regulation that is applied to banking in the United Kingdom, I think, gives a solid solidity to the entity. So when we launch, it will have a, you know, a big tick from the regulator. Yeah, indeed. Another one of Commonweal's campaigns is to make banking even more boring. Uh, we actually had a, a, a campaign at one point just called Boring Banking because yeah. we, we quite like that idea of a bank that, for example, um, will let you, say, let you save money at 3%, will loan out money at 6% and just can do that for decades or centuries. If you have an exciting bank taking risks and blowing up the economy every decade... Not so good for the economy, not so good for everyone. And, and actually, well, it is good for some people. Ah, it's, true. It's, it's, it's good for the people who want to extract out of it. So I think there's a, you know, we will make a big play on being boring. So if you want to, you know, it, it, this isn't an, it needs to do, it needs to pay your salary, you know, your salary needs to come in, it needs to pay your rent, pay your mortgage, you know, be able to work down the supermarket when you're buying stuff and it needs to do all that properly. Yeah. So finally, now uh, halfway through the show, we can get to uh, your organisation itself, Bank Cambria. Tell us just a bit about the history of the project and how, how did how, and, and your involvement, your history within this within um, this project. Uh, well, I'll start with that because that's quick and, and easy. So I'm not a banker. Um, I've no interest in being a banker. Um, I have an interest in wanting to, to get change to happen. Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of people who suggested that banking is too difficult a thing to, too difficult a problem to solve and to have our own entity. So um, a group of us got together um, following some quite uh, good lobbying of who was then the finance director, a uh, finance minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, um, and said, this is an opportunity for us. And it's based on a model that was developed by the community savings bank association of having a you know pick up a bank in a box mm. deploy it in wales bob's your uncle um so i was became the project lead on that and, and my role was just to you know it sounds very um it could be very it could have been very complicated but i think my role was very simple and the first thing and i remember writing this in our initial paper make people believe we can have a bank because actually people don't yeah. believe we can do it to start off with so if, you know, if I wanted to, if I sat back and judged my, um, how well it's worked over the past couple of years, I now think people believe we can have a bank. Um, so that was the toughest gig. I think we've, the other thing I've learned, and this, this surprised me, banking is not as complicated as bankers like to make you think it is. Um, <laughs> so, you know, going back to that boring um refrain that we talked about it i think that comes into it as well this is a it's a very simplistic model there are lots of protections around it which is which i get which is fine but actually this is um being prudent with people's cash wanting to be that you know banks want to be there for the 150 years 200 years you, you've got to have the the ambition to be solid um and i think that fits with with this as well so we were set up we're a project team um, to look at it to develop it and we came up with the the name bank cambria um, bank spelt with a c in the welsh way and cambria obviously being the latin for wales because we didn't want to translate um our signs we wanted to keep the signs as they as they are and the you know i think the people quite like the brands um they quite like the name i feel it talks to them a bit now we've got a <laughs> deliver the product at the, alongside it but, uh, it's been hard work i think it's probably you know on reflection one of the silliest things i've ever decided to get <laughs> involved with um but i i you know we're close now so we're um 
it's in the public domain, we're working with somebody else to deliver the project now, an existing financial institution who are based in Wales. Um, and and we've our the, the regulators are looking at what we're doing today. So we are at the point of um, being very close. And it, <laughs> as soon as, it, you know, I don't, I don't see my role staying with the project once it launches, particularly for very long, just to embed some brand values into it and then um, look for something else. But I've, I've loved it and I feel to feel, you know, I want to see that bank branch in place soon now. That's, that's where I work, where I want to be. And maybe once you're done, you can come up to Scotland and do it again. Uh. But, but I got fascinated. I've got this, I got this, I think we need to um, spend some time thinking about what a central bank would really mm. um, look like. So I have an, so I have an inkling of a project, next project in my head, which I want to get my head, get into. So how, you, you've talked a little bit about this through the, through the show. How will Bank Cambria be different from the other retail banks, especially in, in things like how it's how it operates and how it's owned? So I think ownership's critical. So it'll be mutually owned and a one member, one vote, which takes away those extractive shareholders out of the operation. Um, in terms of what it does, <laughs> I repeat, my, it, there'll be a boring, so it will do what it needs to do. But I think there'll be things that it won't do. So we... Uh, have already concluded that we won't operate a credit card, for example. There's lots of credit cards out there, but credit card debt is one of those debts that can be mm. pretty damaging to individuals and the communities in which they live. So, what, so there are things that I think we'll decide not to do, even if they may have high profitability, because profit isn't the central element of what we do. What we'll be wanting to do is deliver as a sustainable operation. Um, you know. From a pricing perspective, it will be middling, so it'll have it'll be within the market rates for um, mortgages and loans and 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 savings and so on. Um, and it's you know will be committed to being close to where people are in Wales. So we we you know at centre to this is a um, the establishment of a network of outlets that mean that everyone in Wales will be relatively close to a bank Cambria within the first five years. So it's got an ambitious programme of um, growth in terms of outlets. But I think the uh, critical thing, and we've, and we've said this and the partners have said this as well, is that when we drop a pin in a place, we want that pin to stay. So, yeah. you know, we're not going to be, you know, rocking up at a car park of a supermarket in a porter cabin and hoping people there. We'll be in, in the town centre will be bricks and mortar, um, you know, we will be there and we'll, we, we will be there for the long term as well. So this is a, you know, picking those places is going to be important. Um, and it's, that that isn't as difficult as I once thought it was as well, because you can start to see as you, as you map Wales and you see where important communities have lost provision, you can see where you might want to go to first. And I, I suppose... To finish off this point, the last thing is that we've got to be a bank for the whole of Wales. So Wales is is, is a different place in different. You know, I'm saying this to someone in Scotland. You, you, you've got to be a country, that, but um, you know we've got borderlands towns that um, most of the flow is just straight across. And there's even towns that, that are actually sat directly on the border between yeah. England and Wales. We've got to provide for them as same way as we've got to provide for rural communities in Welsh speaking northwest. Wales um, and you know the the urban valley communities as well so we've got to make sure that we're seen to be the bank for the whole of Wales not just niche pe groups that we think are um, underserved at the moment so that's that's critical to it. Yeah the, the, the community side of this is probably the, the most important part for me and and now with the, the political drive towards the the 20 minute neighbourhood um, where critical public services and, and critical general services should be reachable um, through public transport or active travel within 20 minutes, no matter where you live. Banking surely must be part of that. So that, again, just you, you draw your map and you draw your bubbles of 20 minute travel around yeah. population centres. That's, that's how many banks you need. 
Yeah, and and it's not as many. So when you start to do those, particularly, I think the, the challenge comes when you've got to, you know, so that you start to hit other problems that we can't solve. So you start then to say, well, what about public transport networks? And you realise how poorly served some communities are yes. by public transport, for example. But I think what we've got to do is be able to you, not wait for all these things to happen and start to build the, you know, the institution and if, where we can, and if we've got the ability to challenge um, the public transport network uh, to be better, then we can use our voice at some point in the future. But it does make you realise that actually a lot of this is, you know, we, we, we are so dependent on things that, that aren't good for our, you know, ecology, you know, car travel is, is central to um, a lot of these things as well. So it's, um, yeah, there's, there's a, I wouldn't say there were compromises, but there's a lot of things that, you recognise as you start, if you want to think about a banking network, that you start to touch a bunch of other stuff that's important. Yeah. So let's talk now about the, the political support and the political journey. You mentioned Mark Drake, for uh, now First Minister of Wales, who has included uh, community banking in the, the recent programme for government, um, which was uh, the, the final catalyst for me getting in contact with you and get, uh, getting you on the yeah. show. Um, but can you just talk about sort of winding that back to... You know, perhaps when you got involved or, or before and, and what's it been like in the political field getting this onto the agenda? I think um, it's the same with everything, I suppose. You, 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 this is a, there's a lot of shared ambition around community banking that, that doesn't sit within political parties. And I think um, what, you've, what you've got is, so Mark Drakeford was very keen on this and saw this, but he, saw, he probably saw this through his, prism his viewpoint as to how this would work and I think what we've been trying to do is to be able to bring other people in as as we go so we've had you know we've, we've made a point of keeping the um opposition parties engaged with our progress and we've learned from them there was a quite a good um study done by the uh, EIS committee the enterprise infrastructure um, committee last year who looked at um bank access to banking and they, they actually referenced community banking as well and they they questioned us over uh, you know whether or not this is a, you know can you build a sustainable operation and can you do you know, the real good challenges that came through and i'd like to think that we've addressed all of the points that came out of that cross-party group because then when you come back and say well we've listened to you we've con we've concerned ourselves with the things that you were concerned with so therefore it becomes you know an easy easier sell to them as, as politicians but in, you know one of the things that uh, politicians you see from whatever color they are um you they have the same post bag so the post bag saying my bank's yeah. gone and i'm worried about it it matters not a jot whether it's in a labor held constituency applied constituency or a tory constituency you know they there are the, the same issues so i think you know there is a a sense of um shared recognition that there's an issue and there's an issue in Wales. I think the other thing that has been um, I'm particularly pleased with is that we've been able to show that the solution that we've got is deliverable um, because it, you oft, too often find that, that some of these things become, they're just good ideas. You know, they just stay good ideas. Whereas we've actually, I think we're close to actually making something happen. Mm -hmm. And that for, a, you know, for someone like, so Mark Drakeford is obviously confident that we can deliver to, for, to, for, to go into the programme of government. You know, he's, and he's been close to this from the start. You know, he feels confident that it's going to deliver. And what we've tried to do then is make sure the other parties are as close as they possibly can be to know what we're doing so that when, you know, someone stands up in the Senate and says, I'm proud to announce we're going to, you know, invest some of your money in it, albeit commercially, in this entity to capitalise it. I would hope that we can get the rest of the parties to go, and I think this is a good idea yeah. because of X, Y and Z. Um, and I think the other, just on the political stuff, but I think it's too easy as well to focus on our Senate. Um, but the councils are really important in this, you know, councillors, know their area really well we've been actively yes. engaged with some town and community councils as well because they often have premises in local places and they can see the issues and i think the other thing as well is you know not to discount um 
uh, Westminster politicians as well, because they um, also have the ability to be able to, uh, their voices are slightly, come at this from a slightly different voice and, and they see the same problem. So it's, um, you know, that's probably our, you know, our biggest success so far has been keeping this, you know, if this, I was going to say ragtag bag, but I won't say that because they're, you know, earnest, well-meaning politicians. But to keep this group support in this, I think, has been one of our um, key focus points. Yeah, and it is, it's probably important not to discount uh, the UK government in this because, after all, they have the they have the strings of the regulator. So it, it could be up to Westminster to to change financial regulations to make community banking easier or make it preferable compared to the conventional retail banks. Yeah, and I think we're somewhat, so there are some good noises um, in that regard. And uh, Tony Green from Southwest Mutual, you may have come across, have been working quite hard on influencing Westminster um, politicians in this regard, and he's had some success. I think, you know, some of these things, and, and this is, uh, I suppose, one of our, one of my one of our mantras in this project is that we need to deal with do with what we can do with what's available today so that we can deliver this within the current environment in this way that gets things moving it would be preferable if this regulation had changed and the regulator looked at this in a different way and all these things i i, I get that but you know communities i mentioned prestatin newcastle m Lim, buckley you know you, we could roll off all these places that have lost provision they can't they can can't wait for the uk government to solve the problem and the uk government yeah. have had the opportunity to you know push banks and they failed to do it so you know at some point we can just go well, all right we're going to do what we can we may not have competence which Welsh government don't but what we can do is support this which is a regulated entity to go and do what it needs to do well Mark, at this point in the show, I usually ask what's next uh, for the project, but I guess it's more a question for me because your answer is we get the bank running and we, <laughs> we get going with it. Um, so, so really the question is what's next for community banking in Scotland? And I guess this is where I have a, a, a small plea to our, our listeners to, to uh, get in touch with your local councillors, your MSPs and your MPs and start demanding this kind of banking. I'll, I'll, in fact, I'll leave a link in the description um, to a... a a really good website called Write to Them, uh, which will uh, allow you to get directly in touch with all of your representatives at all levels. And please get in touch and send them a link to the podcast and uh, send them a link to our papers, send them a link to, to uh, Bank Cambria and say, we want this. Because uh, as you say, Wales is sneaking ahead of Scotland in this and we can't have that. Uh, so we'll need to catch up. <laughs> we weren't going to talk about football either, were we? So that's the other thing. <laughs> Oh, I, I stick to rugby. <laughs> well, 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 unless there's a rugby tournament going on, then I stick to something else. <laughs> well, you, you know, you've got our. If, if there's anything we can do to to help, we we'd be more than happy to do it. And I know that the um, CSBA are quite keen to be able to influence as well in this area. So you know, let's keep the channels open. And when we're yes. when it's easier to travel, you know, perhaps a trip up um, beyond. Uh, you know, the, our, the north of, of my country I can come up. I am embarrassed to say that I haven't visited Wales in far too long and I'm more than overdue a holiday to come down and see, see, see the place so I will make a point of it as uh, once, once it's possible to do it safely. Um, so I will round up the podcast here with my usual message to all of our listeners just to remind you that Commonweal is an organisation that is entirely funded by folk like yourselves. We don't have government funding. We don't have corporate sponsors, uh, not even the banks. Um, we don't even have adverts on our website. So all the things that we do from the policy papers we produce to this podcast, to all of our campaigning is all supported by folk like yourselves. So if you're in a position to, to help support and donate to, to Commonweal, we have a link in the description to the podcast and we thank everybody who allows us to produce this fantastic work and allows us to, to make Scotland a better place and hopefully make it even better than Wales is heading. <laughs> so, Mark, thank you for coming on to the show. It has been a fascinating chat. And for everyone else, we'll speak to you again next week. Thank you.